You're watching the Physics Classroom's video tutorial series on Newton's Laws, and the topic of this video is Newton's Second Law. There's two basic questions we wish to answer in this video, and the first is, what claims does a second law make regarding the acceleration of objects? And the second question is, how can we use Newton's Second Law to compare acceleration values, predict an acceleration value, or simply predict how an object will move? Let's get started. Newton's laws are all about this relationship between force and the subsequent motion. One of the most central questions you always ask is, are the individual forces that act upon the object balanced? And if the answer to the question is yes, the forces balance each other out, then you can be certain that the object will not accelerate. That is, if the object's at rest, it stays at rest. If the object's moving, keeps moving with that same speed in that same direction. And that's Newton's first law of motion. Now, if the answer to our question is no, the individual forces are not balanced, then what we're talking about is Newton's second law, that the object's going to accelerate. And the exact nature of the acceleration, the direction, the magnitude, etc., is predicted by Newton's second law of motion. So if we had to state Newton's second law in words, we'd say something like this. The acceleration of an object acted upon by an unbalanced force is directly proportional to the amount of net force that acts upon the object and inversely proportional to the amount of mass that the object possesses. And this acceleration is in the same direction as the net force that acts upon the object. So if we go back to that original question, are individual forces balanced? If the answer to it is no, then we know the object accelerates. That acceleration has a magnitude that depends upon two variables, first upon the net force and second upon the mass. Directly proportional to net force, inversely proportional to mass. So now we have to ask the question, what, is exa what exactly is meant by the net force? So now what is net force? Well, we sometimes refer to it as the vector sum of all the forces. That is to say, it's what you get when you take all the individual forces and you add them up as vectors, considering their left and rightness and their up and downness, and you add them all up. For instance, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice that there's four forces acting upon the object. Two of them, the up and the down, are of equal magnitude, and so they balance each other out. But then there's the right force and the left force, and the right force is bigger. It's bigger than the left force by an amount of 15 newtons. So we say the net force is 15 newtons to the right. Like any force, net force has both magnitude, here it's 15 newtons, and direction, here it's to the right. I like to teach students to think of these force diagrams as little tug-of-wars. And what the net force tells you is it tells you who won the tug-of-war. In this case, the tug-of-war is won by the rightward force. And the 15 newtons, well, that tells you the winning margin. So net force tells you who won the tug-of-war and by how much. So Newton's second law makes the claim that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. Let's look at the data here in this data table. One thing that we notice when we look at the data is we look at, at row 2. We notice that its value for net force is twice the value of row 1. And what happened when we doubled that value of net force from 20 to 40 is we caused the acceleration to double as well from 4 to 8. Now if we look at row 1 and 3, what we notice about row 3 is the net force value there is three times as much as row 1. 60 newtons is three times the 20 newtons of row 1, and it caused the acceleration to change from 4 meters per second squared to 12 meters per second squared. So tripling the net force caused a tripling of the acceleration. And then finally, if we look at row one and row four, what we noticed in these two rows is that the, the net force of row four is one half the value of row one. And when you half this value of net force from the 20 newtons down to the 10 newtons, you cause the acceleration to be halved as well. It was four meters per second squared in row one, and the halving of the net force caused the acceleration to be halved from four to two meters per second squared. So when we see these types of numbers, what we say is that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force because whatever change we make 
in the net force, the acceleration changes by that same factor. So we could write this in terms of symbols, something like this. We could say the acceleration is proportional to net force. That little fish-like looking symbol is the proportional sign. Or we could say A is equal to K times F net, where K is the proportionality constant. This describes the acceleration net force relationship. Now let's look at the acceleration mass relationship as portrayed by this table of data. When we look at rows 1 and 2, what we observe is that the row 2 mass value is 2 times the row 1 mass value. What did that cause the acceleration to do? It caused the acceleration value to be halved. It changed from 12 down to 6. So doubling mass has halved the acceleration value. Then if we look at row 1 and 3, what we observe is that the row 3 mass value is 3 times the row 1 mass value. What did that do to the acceleration? It caused the acceleration to become one third of the original value. The 12 has turned into 4. And then finally, if we look at row 1 and row 4, what we observe is that the row 4 mass value is is one half the row one mass value. What did that cause the acceleration to do? Well, it caused it to double. When we look at numbers like this, we realize that these two values, acceleration and mass, are inversely proportional. When one goes up, the other goes down. And it goes down by the inverse factor. So by whatever factor you change the mass, the acceleration changes by the inverse or by the reciprocal factor. We could express this relationship in terms of symbols something like this. A is proportional to 1 over m or A is equal to k divided by m where k is some sort of proportionality constant. We can use Newton's second law to make comparisons of the relative acceleration of objects if we know some information about their mass and the net force they experience. Like here in this question, we're asked to rank these four objects according to their acceleration. So if we want to pick the object with the greatest acceleration, we're looking for things like a big force and a small mass. And object B is just perfect for this. It has the biggest force and the smallest mass of all the objects. So it has the greatest acceleration. Then if we're looking for the second biggest acceleration, we want to look for a bigger F and a smaller M. And so we're, our attention is drawn to object C, which has the biggest force of the remaining three objects, and it has a mass that is sort of of the remaining three objects is, is tied for the smallest. So it gets the greatest acceleration. That leaves us with a ranking of object A and object D. And if we look at these two objects, what we notice is that they both experience the same net force. But object A has a smaller mass. So smaller mass means bigger acceleration. The acceleration of object A has to be greater than object D. So you can see how we can just use relative information about force and mass in over order to rank objects according to their acceleration. So far we've talked about Newton's second law in terms of two proportionality statements that A is directly proportional to F net and inversely proportional to mass. It ends up that these two proportionality statements are actually expressed by an equation that goes A is equal to F net divided by M. Once we know that equation, A equal F net divided by M, we can use the equation to actually make a prediction of the acceleration of an object if given a force diagram like the one that you see here. We know all the individual forces that are acting upon the object, so if we want to add them up as vectors, we would end up finding that the 36 Newton's force overwhelms the leftward 24 newtons force by 12 newtons. So we would describe the 12 newtons to the right as being the net force. We're told this is a 3 kilogram object. So if we want to calculate the acceleration, we have to use this equation. F net divided by mass is equal to the acceleration. So we take the 12 newtons and we divide it by the 3 kilograms and we get 4 meters per second squared. And the direction of this acceleration will always be in the same direction as the net force. So 4 meters per second squared to the right. So it was just mentioned that the acceleration of an object is always in the same direction as the net or unbalanced force. It's something that you can just simply count on. 
So if you look at these three force diagrams that you see here, what we can say for the force diagram on the left is that the rightward force is bigger than the leftward force, so this object accelerates to the right. If we look at the diagram in the middle, what we notice is that the downwards force is bigger than the upwards force. The unbalanced force or net force is downwards, so this object accelerates downwards. And finally, if we look at the diagram on the, the right, what we observe is that the leftward force exists and there's nothing to counteract it to the right. So the net force or unbalanced force is to the left, and we would say this object also accelerates to the left. So the one thing you're guaranteed of, guaranteed of is that the acceleration of the object is always in the direction of the net force or unbalanced force. So viewing a force diagram allows us to predict which way an object will accelerate. But what about the direction that it moves? Can we look at a force diagram and determine which way an object moves? And the answer is absolutely not. Like if you look at this force diagram, there's more force to the right than to the left. So what we know and the only thing we really know for certain is the object's going to accelerate to the right. But if we understand acceleration correctly, then we know that there's two ways to accelerate to the right. This object, whose motion is represented by the force diagram, could be moving to the right and speeding up, because that's definitely a rightward acceleration. But it also could be moving to the left and slowing down, because that too is a rightward acceleration. Now we'll contrast that with a second force diagram shown here on the bottom. There's more force to the left than to the right. So this is an object that is going to accelerate to the left in the direction of the unbalanced force. But does that mean it moves to the left? Absolutely not. This is an object that accelerates to the left and there's two ways to do it. First, the object could be moving to the right and slowing down because that's certainly an acceleration to the left and then the object could be moving to the left and speeding up. Either way, we cannot tell whether from a force diagram which way an object is moving, only the direction that it accelerates. So here's some take-home truths, some things that we can be certain of learning about Newton's second law. First of all, A and F are directly proportional. A larger F means a larger acceleration. A and M are inversely proportional. The larger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. We can put this together into an equation of the form acceleration equal F net divided by mass. We know the direction of the acceleration is always in the same direction that the net force acts upon it. And finally, what we can never know from a force diagram is which way an object moves. So the acceleration and the net force, they go the same direction but the direction of the motion, that's quite another story. Now at this time in every video, I'd like to give you an action plan to help you out, but before I help you out with that, could you help us out? If you like the video, maybe you could uh, click on the like button down below, maybe even subscribe to the channel, and once you do, tap on the bell and you'll get notifications when new videos come out, which is quite regularly this time of year. And then finally, we'd love to hear from you. Leave a question or comment down below. Now, here's your action plan. At our website, we have a section called the Concept Builder section. The students love Concept Builders. It's a great way to reinforce your learning. Here's some links in the description section below to any one of these three. They'd be a great way to reinforce your learning on Newton's Second Law. If you're a Minds on Physics user, you ought to try app number two. You can get it on your phone or your tablet. And when you do, what you should check out is the Newton's Laws module of app number two. Look at missions NL7 and NL8. Those two missions are a great review of Newton's Second Law. And finally, on our website, what you'll notice is that there's a tutorial section, a written tutorial that that is a great way to freshen up on the topic of Newton's second law, or for that matter, any topic. Whatever you do, we wish you the best of luck.